right. Hello, everyone. My name is Xiao Yan Song, and I am the electronic resource librarian at the North Carolina State University. And on behalf of the Mystic Continual Education Committee, I'd like to welcome you to our July webinar, Counter Release 5, presented by Lorraine Estill and Oliver Pash. So before the presentation, I have a few quick announcements. First, this webinar will be recorded and shared to NASIC Listserv. And second, if you have any questions for um, our presenters during the presentation, please enter them into the WebEx Q&A box, located at the lower right corner of the WebEx window. If you don't see the Q&A box, click on the Q&A icon in the upper right corner of the WebEx window. The Q&A box will then appear in the lower right corner. Lorraine Estelle and Oliver Pash will answer your questions at the end of their presentation. And finally, when the webinar is over, you will be directed to a survey about the webinar. I hope that you will take a few minutes to fill it out and let us know how we are doing, what we can do better, and share ideas for future webinars. And with that, I will introduce our speakers for today. Lorraine Estelle is the Counter Project Director. Launched in March 2002, Counter is an international initiative serving librarians, publishers, and intermediaries by setting standards that facilitate the recording and reporting of online usage statistics in a consistent, credible, and a compatible way. So Lorraine is experienced in the information industry with a background in libraries, consortia, share services, vendors, and publishers. She has managed and conducted a wide range of projects with a particular interest in new business models for electronic information resources and has directed the development of a number of UK national shared services, including GIS collections and the journal's usage statistic portal. Oliver Patch works as a product strategist for EBSCO information services where he helps set direction for EBSCO's stuff and e resource products and services. Oliver is a strong supporter of standards and is very involved in the development of standards related to usage. He has been involved with Counter since the outset serving on the executive committee, the, the uh, technical advisor group, and most recently serving as chair of the Counter board. He is co-chair of the NISO Sushi Standing Committee and the NISO Keyboard Automation Working Group. Oliver speaks regularly about usage and e-resources and is a regular contributor to Serious Library through his Spotlight on Standards column. So, and with that, I will uh, now turn things over to our presenters. Thank you, Shui Shong. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much for that introduction, and I hope you can all hear me okay. Uh, do let me uh, or the organisers know if not. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, all of you, for, for joining us here today. Oliver and I are very much looking forward to telling you what is new with Release 5 um, and uh, what we've been working on for the past 18 months. Um, I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank our NASIC hosts for enabling this webinar and giving us this great opportunity um, to talk to you all today. So, uh, release five. Um, I'm just going to give you a brief introduction before handing over uh, to Oliver, who will tell you all about the detail. Um, one of the things that quite a few uh, people have asked us is, is why do we need a new release? Um, we ran a, a survey back in 2015, and we asked people uh, what they thought of, of release four and what we needed to do really to, to improve and meet the priorities. And I think the feedback we had, both from librarians and from publishers and vendors, were, were very clear and very consistent. They told us that the current code of practice is too complex, that there were inconsistencies 
uh, in the reports, in the metric types, and in the formats. So they wanted to see a greater simplicity and a greater consistency. Um, but also, of course, the functionality uh, of platforms has changed considerably since Release 4 was introduced. And so uh, we have to re uh, evolve uh, counter the counter code of practice in order to ensure that it is relevant and provides consistent cons uh, statistics across all those different platforms. So that was why. Uh, we have had the most wonderful technical uh, group working on the development of Release 5, uh, starting back in March, or March or April, I think, uh, last year. Uh, they worked very, very hard to really find uh, a new code of practice, something that new, that meets uh, these requirements for simplicity and consistency. Uh, and on that group, we have um, librarians, publishers, and vendors. So all the stakeholders involved uh, have been well uh, represented in the development of release findings. When the group got together, they agreed their terms of reference, uh, what, what they wanted to achieve. So the objective they set themselves was to seek that balance between addressing those changing needs, and very importantly, reducing the complexity of the code of practice, and above all, to ensure that all publishers and content providers are able to achieve compliance. Again, a really important priority that we got from you all uh, back in 2015. You want to see uh, content providers uh, really being compliant and really to see that long tail coming in and providing counting usage statistics. So those were the objectives, and I think our, our technical group have done a great job in addressing them. So now I'm going to ha ho sorry, hand over to Oliver, who is going to tell you uh, all about the detail of Release 5. So here we are, Oliver, over to you, I think. Once I get unmuted, it works much better, I find. <laughs> that always helps. <laughs> I know, I know. So thanks, Lorraine. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, let's get into the uh, exciting stuff here. So one of the ways we looked at um, sort of simplifying and uh, dealing with consistencies was in the area of reporting. And uh, it was release five. In rethinking reporting, we now have four what we call master reports. One for each um, level, if you want, to, if you were of reporting a platform, database, titles, which could be books or journals, um, and items, which actually gets into the reporting of multimedia items, articles, and other things that might be in uh, repositories. So the the goal with the master reports is that a librarian would use these reports, um, and you can actually customize reports and get the analysis specific to your needs. And that goal with these reports was to eliminate a lot of the um, reports that were developed over the years with Counter, where we had a report specifically for mobile views or gold open access. and um, and these sorts of things. So um, the idea is that with master reports, you can um, focus on just the areas of interest without requiring a change to the code of practice to get at what, you, at what you need. So this would be kind of an example of, of what such a, a user interface would look like. This is just a mock-up, but you can kind of see here where you specify your dates of usage. Um, you can choose which metric types, data types, whether it's a journal or book, um, access types, regular access, like controlled access, we call it, or gold open access, that sort of thing, 
your publication, etc. And then you can submit and, and basically produce your report, narrowing it down to the criteria that, that you're looking for. <clears throat> and this will be pretty much a huge advance forward, I think, for the uh, area of, of usage reporting, particularly um, when it's now implemented by all publishers or a number of publishers at least. So that's all well and good, but the flexibility um, is somewhat problematic if all you really want to do is certain things. And so to address that challenge, you can see um, under the bold of the master reports are what we're calling standard views. And the standard views are really nothing more than a preset set of, of um, limits and filters that a uh, content provider must provide for those reports that are actually applicable to them. And so some quick examples here. In the database reports, so the database search, um, search and item usage is what you would get if you want to analyze the performance of databases. And by having a standard view, uh, the goal would be all libraries can use the same view and thus have comparative statistics. If we uh, go ahead and jump down to the title reports, um, there's reports for books. The book request report would resolve the, um, replace the book reports one and book reports two. Uh, you can see access denied there. Journal requests, that would be a standard view that would replace journal report one. Um, and we also have journal requests by year of publication. And the goal with that particular one would be if you need to sort of dig into the details for journals, um, compare usage against your ex perpetual access rights and those sorts of things, this would be the usage report for that. And we get to um, this example with the multimedia uh, reports as well. So with the reports, the master reports creates the opportunity for flexibility um, to do some pretty interesting ad hoc reporting. And the standard views allow for sort of consistent reporting across the, uh, the library community as you pull reports and pull usage for your various surveys and that sort of thing. Okay, so a quick look at what a report would look like. <clears throat> And this is a standard view, and this particular one, if we zoom in, is the um, journal requests. So this is um, full text usage, basically. And um, it is for things that are not open access. You'll see all reports, when you, when you dig in deeper, all have this common header. There's a uh, two column header. Uh, labels are explicitly um, set in column A, and the first 12 rows are all the same values no matter what report you're getting, and column B is, are the values for those. So for those applications that are trying to ingest these reports, it makes it far, far easier to use when you know this consistency between the reports. In the uh, next we zoom in and we look at the columns. And again, we've, we've, we've tried to go for consistency in columns, in column names, column labels, rather. And if we look over a little bit more to the right, uh, you can see, for example, we've spelled out metric type. If you recall from release four, and we'll talk about this more in a minute, um, there really was no metric type column. It was just assumed everything was full text usage. So this way it's explicit. You will also notice here that we've got um, two rows per title is the total item requests and the unique 
item requests. So the total item requests would be, um, for example, you cook a PDF, you cook an HTML, um, that would count as one each in a given session, so that would be count of two. But the unique item requests would say, well, let's only count that as one uh, unique item because that item was accessed once. It didn't matter how many times in the session. Okay, so. Let's look at how we've done some simplifications to metric types and related attributes to metric types. So starting with the metric types, on the left, you see the 25 metric types that made up release four. And you'll see a lot of these FT, EPUB, FT, HTML, FT, HTML, mobile. And so the metric types were serving multiple purposes. They were attempting to define the, the, uh, the, so the nature of the content, i.e. full text retrieved, the nature of the activity, as well as the format and sometimes, in the case of mobile, the nature of the device is actually doing the requesting. On the right, you see we've, we've changed it up quite a bit. Um, on a terminology perspective, we moved away from the, the full text name, be, uh, mainly because when you start looking at scholarly content today, it might be video, it might be audio, um, it might be full text, and so forth, images. So the, the notion of calling things full text um, was no longer suitable. So we, we looked more at um, this, this idea of investigations and requests. We'll talk more about those in a minute. But you see there's now 12 metric types. And let's dig in a little deeper into those. So one of the challenges we had when we first uh, started discussing the concept was the confusion between investigations and requests. And requests is really about getting at the full content. Investigations is really a superset metric that the user took some action on um, an item or, or something related to the item. They might have viewed the abstract, they might have linked to a link resolver, they might have viewed cited references, they might have looked at an article preview, linked to an ILL form, gone to OPAC, they might have viewed the full text, the PDF, and otherwise looked at the full content. All of those constitute investigations, which is really kind of a measure of interest that the users are expressing through their actions on the, uh, on the, on the journal or the article or the database, depending on what level you're, you're measuring. Um, only the ones in the red, uh, which, where you're actually pulling back actual content, are classified as requests. So that was the main um, the main uh, advance there. Um, I'm going to back up one more. So the other notion we touched on this earlier, but the idea of total versus unique. And the idea is the total counts the number of activities that happen during the session. So if I looked at articles um, in PDF or HTML or other during the session, those all add up to the total. Um, with double clicks removed, of course, in case I'm seeing double clicking on the same thing, they don't count. Where the unique item requests, again, are uh, for a given user session, um, the unique item request can only increment once for an article, no matter how many times that article might have been viewed in that session by that user. And the unique title investigations and requests um, that takes that up to the title level. So think of the problem we have today with book reports. In book report one, um, that reports the number of times um, a book 
was accessed where the full book was delivered as a single PDF. And in Book Report 2, um, would become from probably another site where they do ebooks, and that is a number of times sections of the book were viewed um, <clears throat> in a session. And in those cases, the books are delivered by chapter or a section or, or what have you. So when you attempt it, if you've ever done this and tried to to match up book report one and book report two, or you transition from one ebook vendor to another that does a different style, you know, delivering a book, you find possibly an order of magnitude difference in the usage. And it's not that one's using more content than the other, it is just how it's delivered. So the unique titles requests and investigations is a new metric that was introduced to uh, provide a lowest common denominator measure of ebook usage, regardless of how the content was delivered. All right, so let's get into some of the other areas. You can get this thing to click, there we go. So we added some other attributes. As you remember in, in release four, we would do full text, um, mobile and full text, I'm trying to remember some of the other things we were doing, but, but basically we tried to combine things together in the metric type and that really didn't work all that well. So what we've done is we've introduced a series of attributes that are captured at the time of the transaction and made available to, through reporting and, and we'll walk through each of these one at a time. So the notion of a data type and that really identifies uh, sort of the content that is being accessed or being reported on. So a data type, you might be reporting on usage of a journal, a book for item level. It could be a, um, an article or an item or so forth. And, and the idea is we, we capture um, this uh, Attribute of the um, of, of the work being being uh, um, used or accessed, <clears throat> and then use it in reporting. Now, this will allow us to do things like create a standard view of um, journal usage, and then we can limit the data type journal, or um, similarly for book. So it's it's um, <clears throat> it's a good way for us to, um, to break things down, make them a little more granular, and also get some of the noise out of some of the reporting. Because today in uh, journal report one, oftentimes it gets confused. Sometimes we get reports in there and newspapers in there and so forth. And um, that creates uh, a challenge for comparability if nothing else. The section types, this is really about the chunk that was accessed. And, and it goes back to the uh, ebook problem where the entire book might be retrieved with a click, or um, you might get a chapter or a section, or in the case of like a, um, an encyclopedia, an article those sorts of things. So again, by having that as being captured um, in the master reports, it provides an opportunity to do some interesting reporting on usage by the various uh, section types. Access type, and, and that is describing sort of the nature of the access control that was in place when the content, when the user clicked the link. So if it was content that requires a subscription or pay-per-view paid or, or what have you, and that was paid, that would be viewed as controlled. So that was under access control. Um, if, and I'm going to jump down to, it was gold open access, then that would be categorized as 
gold open access. We also have open access delayed or OA delayed, and that's intended to capture uh, usage of content that is now open access, but it was made available after an embargo period of a year, two years, or, or whatever the agreement is. And the reason we're reserving that for future use is we know there's a strong desire to have this, but in discussion with publishers and, uh, and, and various content providers, it became clear that many of them don't have the systems in place to actually track that level of detail. And it would be prohibitively uh, expensive and, and probably not possible to introduce that in a timely manner. So the goal is Counter will seek to create another little working group that will investigate and, and work on this and help publishers and all um, sort of, should we say, evolve to the state where we can uh, introduce the OA delayed at a future date. At a future date. Uh, repositories may also have, it's called other free to read, which is basically, it's, it's not controlled, it's available, um, and there could be a variety of conditions for that, but it's lumps them all together. Access method. I'm not sure that was the best term for this, but Really what this is about is allowing us to keep regular usage, what the usage of a typical user using content through uh, you know, a database discovery publisher site, and keep that separate from usage that might have been generated through text and data mining activities. So if, if somebody has a, um, an agreement with the publisher to use their content for text and data mining, they will go in and they will download every article. Um, and uh, if you add that into the regular usage, then it really skews the numbers because it's unlikely that in a given month, every article of every journal from that publisher will be used. So by keeping them separate, this keeps it all nice and clean. And in the code of practice, we try to make it fairly clear as to what the differences are and, and, and under what circumstances you would, would count something as regular versus text and data mining. Uh, year of publication. So in counter release four, we had journal report five, which alluded to year of publication being tracked. And now we're saying it needs to be tracked explicitly. Uh, well, when you know it, if you don't know it, it's 0001, and if it's an article in press, it's all nines. But um, the idea is that you can then use that um, in your analysis and in the reporting. And then again, the key use for this is going to be um, checking usage and then trying to compare that usage against the age of the content, either whether it's in a paid archive or whether it's um, associated with perpetual access rights or not. Okay, report formats. They've already given me a sneak preview of one of them, but let's sort of go back and, and look at how uh, some of these stack up. So in the background, we've got journal report one from release four. In the foreground is database report one. And we've highlighted just a couple of areas You'll notice in the database report, we did have this thing called user activity, where we broke things out by the nature of the activity. And in the Excel, in the um, um, journal report, uh, we have actually broken down totals by PDF and HTML. Um, so th of interest here is if you were to look at what's returned by Sushi, um, the names of the labels, the fields are different in release four. The actual names of the metric types, like uh, regular searches, is searches underscore reg in, uh, in Sushi. Um, in Sushi for the uh, HTML and PDF in release four, you would get the breakdown by month. In 
the Excel file, you get totals across the reporting period. And as you can imagine, if you're in an environment where you load some of each, you create a bit of a mess because everything's different. And so we, we're seeking to, to resolve that. And, and, that, and we believe we have. So we talked about this already. Consistent header, all reports share the same header. Interestingly, in column A, those labels that appear are the same values that appear in the sushi return report. And the same with the consistent detail, the um, title publisher, et cetera, the labels used. Um, here are the same as in the sushi. And we've split it up by metric type. Vocabulary, we're trying to keep it all consistent. Which leads us to sushi. <clears throat> and uh, or because it's counters implementation of sushi, counter sushi. So for release five, it will be different. And it's it's um, Stemming from the work of the uh, NISO uh, Sushi uh, Standing Committee and a working group they have on what they call Sushi Light. And Sushi Light is reimagining sushi not as an XML SOAP based, a simple object access protocol that returns XML, but, but a sort of a new, more modern, uh, what's called a RESTful interface that returns JSON. And the reason JSON's of interest is that most modern web-based languages use that inheritably na natively, and so they can basically handle those objects almost automatically. Familiar to most web developers, how to use these, how to use these services. Um, you know, we start hearing a lot about you know web services and microservices. This is making uh, Counter and Sushi just sort of part of that environment. Um, so it's kind of cool. We're, you know, we're talking about pulling back reports. But, um, there's also the capability of, of, of pulling back um, snippets of usage. So for example, include in the request an ISSN and just get back the usage for that journal. And that allows you potentially to start embedding usage in other applications that Otherwise, wouldn't have the capability of, of collecting usage. So very much like if you're reading a news story um, and there's a stock ticker symbol um, that's usually hyperlinked, you can put the mouse over and you can bring back the latest stock price. Well, that's not actually in the article. That's calling a service to, to bring it in. So this new approach really has some uh, some cool potential. So this is an example of a, um, a request. And it's, if you actually get this one and click it, it'll work. It'll, it'll bring you back something. And I'll show you what comes back right here. And I'm sure none of you can read that. What we'll do is we will uh, zoom in a bit. So you'll see the header, and, and if you recall from the other header created created by customer ID, report ID, um, these are all maybe not in the same order. Doesn't really matter, but these are the same labels and the same content that you would have seen in the XML. And if we look down. We see the title is Advanced in Cement Research, Item ID, Print ISSNs, Online ISSNs, all the same data is there. We get down below, we've got for this 2016-01, um, 01 to 0131 is the range, the metric type, total item requests, another metric type, unique item requests with the counts. So <clears throat> information is there, very easy to use, and uh, and as I say, I recommend you give 
give it a try. So I think at this point, it is, yep, it is. It's back to Lorraine, and here it comes, Lorraine. Um, and Lorraine will t talk about some of the challenges we had. We, we came up with draft one of this. We had a lot of feedback, and uh, we um, had a lot of discussion. So Lorraine, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver. Uh, yes, we um, published the first draft of Release 5 in January, and we uh, consulted wide, as widely as we could uh, through webinars, through uh, conference uh, presentations, and through a survey. And we got a great deal of feedback, and if you were one of those people who, who sent in your, your thoughts, thank you very much indeed. They really helped us and the technical group uh, refine and improve release five. Um, a few things that we uh, did as, as a result of that um, is archive was uh, an attribute that we really wanted to have where you would be able to see if, if content uh, usage was coming from content that was current content or whether it was archival content, content uh, that you required under a separate license uh, for a particular journal. But unfortunately, we couldn't really implement that because um, uh, different publishers and uh, vendors sell archives uh, in different ways in different countries and to different customers. So what might be uh, in an archive for one customer isn't necessarily the same for another. Um, but what we do have instead is the year of publication which I think, uh, Oliver, pro probably serves us even better uh, as it sort of worked out. Uh, the other thing you might have seen in the first draft, we had gold, OA Gold APC and OA Gold non-APC. And the uh, OA Gold non-APC uh, related to uh, journals that are open access but where the author doesn't pay an article processing charge. Uh, typically, they're, they're supported by a society publisher. Uh, I think the feedback was that, um, that that was too much detail. That was just getting a bit too granular. wasn't very useful so, uh, and would make the reports bigger. So I think we decided that that was not helpful. Uh, so now we just have the um, OA Gold. Other free to read, again, that was something that we, that we would have liked to have had. Uh, or we certainly explored having, and there we were thinking of articles which um, perhaps the publisher makes freely available uh, to promote a journal or maybe in response to some national or international problem where they think their journal content will be helpful. Unfortunately, it's quite tricky to track that uh, as it moves um, in front of and then behind the paywall. So again, not really practical, uh, but we have retained it uh, for the repositories, as Oliver mentioned. Also, I won't go into great detail again, Oliver's covered, OA delayed. Uh, by this, we really mean uh, content work that publishers make open access after an embargo period. Some journals will make content o open after a year or two. Um, again, that proved uh, quite tricky uh, to iron out. Uh, and that's why we're going to take that work forward uh, and we've reserved it. Standard views specifically focused on library use cases, uh, as Oliver has, has explained, have been introduced to address, um, to address that request. Oops. Uh, other feedback that we got from, from uh, the consultation to the first draft was that people found the investigations and request metrics quite confusing to begin with. Uh, I, I think perhaps uh, we, we uh, really took that on board and we've created a graphic and I, I think we've perhaps be, become better at explaining what these new metrics uh, mean and how they will be used. So. Um, Certainly, if you have questions about them, uh, do let us know in the in the Q and A book uh, Q and A box, and uh, we'll be happy to answer. And 
Again, there was concern about the old HTML and PDF and the transition from release 4 to release 5. And we've addressed this through an inclusion of a section in the Code of Practice uh, that addresses this issue and it provides a mapping from the release 4 metrics to the release 5 metrics. So I think that will really help there in the transition uh, from the old to the new set of metric types. Sorry, I'm being a bit slow here. I'm having a slight difficulty moving up. Ah, right, oops, sorry, I've gone too far now. Uh, yes, now there are a few things that we haven't been able to address directly. Um, one was sessions. Uh, there was a request from uh, some people that they would like to see these uh, back as, a, as something in the, in the counter code of practice. But um, it's not really feasible. The modern interfaces make the sessions very hard to capture and uh, we realized as well even if they could be captured uh, it would be very inconsistent from one publisher to another uh, so we have decided that it is better therefore not to have them uh, another request which uh, we had which was uh, to output the report header onto a separate tab However, we cannot do that directly because when the reports are downloaded as TSV, there are no tabs. Uh, and of course, we, you know, we have to be consistent. But uh, what we have done is re the release five reports have a blank row before the report body. And therefore, uh, you can um, uh, freeze and then you can filter and so on. Uh, so that compensates for that issue. So hopefully that, that's going to be helpful for everybody. Uh, one of the big issues that we have uh, had and a lot of feedback is about the reporting of zero usage. And uh, of course, this is a very, very important issue. Uh, librarians want to know about, obviously they want to know about the use of the content that they're paying for, but they also want to know about the content that they're paying for, which isn't being used uh, for, so that they can make decisions accordingly. However, this is a, a problem to achieve because uh, it says here, not all, but I think all of you might say many publishers produce their counter statistics, um, sorry, do not produce their counter statistics from the same system that they use to manage their access control. And therefore that means that if they report on zero usage, you wouldn't just get zero of the content that you have a license for, you would get zero usage of everything on that publisher's platform, which would be uh, not only make a very long, huge report, but, but would be completely unhelpful. Uh, so we are taking a different approach and working uh, closely uh, with NICE on an, an initiative uh, called the KBART Automation for Sushi Harvesting of both Usage and Entitlement. And really this is looking at a, a more long-term and more sustainable uh, solution where uh, your, your uh, entitlements, your license and your uh, usage can be uh, harvested and, and brought together in that way. Um, again, a lot of feedback, uh, General Title Report 5. Uh, I know that's a very, very important uh, report for decision making. Um, but we believe that the journal um, requests uh, by year of publication uh, in the standard view provides the same information but with greater detail. So we really think that year of publication will enable you um, to, to do the same. Uh, the other big feedback we had, um, and I think uh, particularly um, uh, fr from the US, was that the consortium, um, that consortium reports are not a requirement uh, in release five. And this is that um, due to their size, uh, creating and consuming release for consortium reports was not always possible. And of course, we want to uh, achieve a code of 
practice that is possible for, for everybody to implement. Uh, methods included in, in Release 5 simplify the retrieval of any Release 5 reports for all consortium members. So again, this is a new approach, and Council is committed to facilitating the development of open source tools that will provide consortium administrators uh, with the ability to uh, consolidate usage uh, for, for all of their um, for all of their consortium members. Um, Lorraine, if I may just say one word oh, yes, please like do on, oh, on the consortium. Yeah. So the um, just for point of clarification, uh, counter um, release code of practice release five does acknowledge and support the uh, reporting of usage for consortium. It is just not as a separate set of reports. So yes. there are are tools and tricks that should. Um, in the long run, I know for a lot, it, it, until we you sort of see it, it's, it's hard to imagine, but in the long run, we believe that will make things much, much easier for all consortia involved and, um, and consortia administrators. So we, we think it, even though the specific consortia reports aren't there, um, but the consortia support, I believe, is much stronger in release five. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver. Thanks for that uh, clarification. So uh, we are, are uh, really at a time now where we're going to release um, uh, release release five onto, onto the world, unleash it as it were. Um, but very important, I think, is that we very much support uh, release five and support the content providers in implementing it. So we have uh, quite a few things going on there for for um, for the content providers to support them. We have some friendly guides for providers. Uh, you can see here our, our friendly guide, and we also have a technical uh, friendly guide as well. Um, the guides are on the council uh, website, and although we have made them for providers, I, I think really everybody will find them useful because they've got some very friendly uh, ex explanations of various things. So I, I do recommend them to librarians as, as well as providers, actually. Although that said, we will also be creating some library-specific uh, guides, uh, probably towards the end of the year. Uh, but as the moment of focus is on uh, supporting those that are going to be implementing Release 5, uh, making sure that we do uh, get, get them all there, uh, we have a transition timeline, which we've sent to all the content providers and uh, a graphic explanation of, of how that will work. And in September, uh, after the holidays, we will be running some webinars uh, to support the, um, the content providers. And we have also set up an email forum uh, for those uh, content providers in implementing Release 5. And if, if there is anybody listening who would like to be on that email forum, please do, do send me an email and I will put you on the list. Uh, we are also starting up an email forum for librarians uh, to help them with, with Q&As and so on. So again, if you're interested in being on that email forum, I promise you, you won't get emails every week. It will be uh, more a case of sharing uh, common questions and answers. Uh, again, if you send me your um, your name, I will put you on that list. So, um, as I say, here we are. This is our timeline. We have been working, uh, well, I say we, the technical group, I should say, has been working uh, all through 2016 to design and develop a Release 5. We had the... Uh, consultation from January to April and then really the technical group took all that great feedback and reviewed uh, the release, revised it and we published draft two uh, just after Easter and that's been out there for people to look at and I think really the feedback we've had ha has been very positive and now we are now we've hit the deadline we are going to uh, publish uh, counter release 5 um, 
this week so you will you will all uh, see on the list and so on uh, links to to release five and then we have this 18 month window to um, support guide and encourage uh, compliance with the new release which will have an effective uh, date of january 2019. Um, so here we have on uh, here this is the link to the uh, draft two of release five uh, the final version which is not really great great deal different from the draft will be on the counter website uh, this week and again uses you can link to the draft from our uses website but also uh, uses will have a link to the new uh, release five as well there's my email address lorraine estelle at counterusage.org please let me know if you'd like to join any of the forums uh, and indeed if you have any questions um oh right okay so someone who's want to be added uh, if you send me if you send me your email address that would be great so uh i, was, I think we'd really be keen to to hear uh if there are any questions and to answer them wouldn't we oliver um yes so there's a couple that came in from uh karen harker thank you karen um so the one question i'll just I, i've responded in the chat so I'll, I'll, so it's, it's preserved there, but um, so, so does investigations include requests? And the answer is yes. Investigations also include requests. So the act of looking at the full text is also considered an investigation. These metric types are designed to be looked at separately, not added together. And if you were trying to, for, for example, measure the importance or, or value of a database, um, if a database is just abstract and in, um, indexing, then it's really the activity surrounded the articles, the abstracts, the click that is a value. If it's full text and all the users did would launch off the full text, uh, you wouldn't have a measure of that. So by adding them up, not adding them up, but, but including the requests as a kind of investigation as well, you wind up with a single metric that gives you sort of value whether or not full text is involved. And then there's a second question, is unique item or title limited by user session? And that's a very good point. Yes, it is. Um, so it's, it's you only get to count the uh, the item once or the title once within a user session. And <clears throat> I, if there isn't a session ID, the um, code of practice describes how a content provider would use combination of IP address, browser user agent, and transaction date time to, to um, create a surrogate for that. And that was all the questions that came in on uh, on my side, Lorraine, did you have any more? Uh, I don't think so. All right. Thank you very much, Lorraine Oliver. Yeah, I don't see any other questions coming, but this is very helpful. Um, oh, you're welcome. Anybody, um, we, well, you know where to find us, but please feel free to um, to ask questions um you know no such thing as a bad question with respect to this as we're really trying to uh, make sure we have something that comes out um, clear and concise and we want to make sure whether you're a librarian or a content provider that um, there are no misunderstandings when uh, when january 2019 rolls around is that your dog saying you're done, Lorraine? Sorry, yes, the dog has reappeared. I, he was supposed to be under lock and key. <laughs> I, I do apologize to you all for my dog. All right, I think we still have like a few minutes. If you do have questions, you can tap them in into the uh, Q&A session. But um, if not, I think we can end the section today. session today. Um, I'd like to... Um, all right. Oh, here's one. Okay, I don't. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's one. So, okay. I'm going to read that out so this can be recorded. The question is from Lauren Dan Dyke, and 
is without the session indicator, how would one gather information on number of users? Um, so the uh, calendar today, calendar release four, does not include sessions either. And uh, the, the reason is, you know, we're, we're sort of, shall we say, not disputing the uh, desire to count what would be the equivalent of a gate count in a physical library, but it's more the reflection on the impossibility of the task with, the, with the, today's distributed online systems. So if you're wanting to track something of that nature, I would suggest you may want to look at either leveraging um, metrics on your um, libraries and website or leveraging metrics uh, related to your proxy servers um, and try to capture unique user activity there. But unfortunately, um, trying to pull that data from various um, content providers, sites with various types of user interfaces and so forth is, is not a, a practical thing anymore. Okay. All right. Um, I see a chat just came in from Jason Seiko asking about, will you send out the presentation to attendees? Yes, just want to let you all know that we are going to send the, um, this session will be recorded and the recording will be sent to NISIC Listserv. So, um, okay. Look out for that email come out. Okay. okay. Yep. And University of Victoria asked how uh, the system will identify text and data mining activities, uh, and um, that almost becomes a uh, publisher to publisher uh, task. So typically, text and data mining is only allowed uh, if it's agreed to, um, and usually in writing with the uh, content provider. And when that happens, they would provide you with either a, a login, a special um, API to use, or something that would allow them to uniquely capture the activity. Um, and so if somebody is just simply screen scraping, as the word is, using a, the web interface, um, what's a couple of things are may likely to happen. One is you might get your IP shut off because of uh, what looks like uh, robot usage. Um, but the other is the robot detections and such, that usage would, would hopefully be detected and excluded because it wasn't being used in a, shall we say, a permissible manner. So text and data mining, it's kind of an area that's still, um, that needs explicit permission usually um, with the content provider before you undertake it. Okay. All right. Okay. I didn't see any other question coming. I think um, we can okay. end the session. Mm -hmm. oh, I want to thank yeah. everyone. Yeah, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. And we hope to see you at our next continued education event. Thank Good. you very much for having us. Thank you. Thank you all for attending. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. Yeah, thank you. Bye.